venerable members of the Mahasangha, dear devotees of the Buddha and Buddhist friends, first I am paying my respect to the chief abbot of this wonderful temple. And with his permission and the permission of the other senior monks in attendance, I'd like to give a short Dhamma talk. So as Bhante has shared with you, I uh, grew up uh, not too far from this place, but I never knew about it, unfortunately. I grew up here in the late 80s, early 90s, and I got to see many things. I got to see the LA riots from my window, and I remember uh, someone tried to steal my my dad's car's battery because he had a nice Cadillac. And then uh, my mom went running out with a baseball bat. <laughs> And my father was like, no, no, just let him take it. But my mom, she was like 21. She wasn't having it. So, uh, yeah. I grew up here in Koreatown. The first school I went to was a private uh, Korean uh, daycare school. And not until I grew up later and I looked at the pictures, I realized that I was the only non-Korean there. <laughs> but when I was a little kid, I didn't know the difference. But. So uh, then we moved to uh, uh, like Catalina and Fourth, and uh, then we I've, we went out to the Valley and the Hollywood area. And then later, when I finished high school, I went to the Air Force. I was in the United States Air Force for about 11 years, and I went to Japan, Korea. Uh, I went to Iraq and Afghanistan twice. So I had good times in the Air Force. And then while I was in the Air Force, I learned about Dhamma, well, I took it more seriously because I already knew a little bit about Dhamma when I was in high school. And I practiced Dhamma while I was in Afghanistan and it completely changed my life. So uh, I decided to exit the military and, and practice Dhamma full time. So that's just a little introduction about myself. So, uh, we're in such a, you know, exciting location here in the center of LA and in, in Koreatown. You can have uh, Mexican food, uh, Guatemalan, Salvadorian, Korean, Thai food. You can have anything you want here. And you meet all kinds of people and you have to interact with all kinds of people all the time, people of all different religions and different beliefs. So I wanna share with you, um, some of uh, some accounts of the time uh, during the Buddha, and we can sh we can try to relate the teachings of the Buddha to this kind of multicultural environment where we all have to uh, not only uh, coexist but co-thrive. We have to succeed together also, and how we can succeed together uh, according to the teachings of the Buddha. So during the time of the Buddha, there was a very famous and knowledgeable man named Upali. And Upali was a follower of a different sect. And um, the leader of that sect told Upali, who was a layman, you should go debate the Buddha because you're very wise and smart and you can defeat him very easily. And they had, uh, he told him it was going to be a discussion about uh, about karma, about kamma. And they had a little discussion about it. I don't want to talk about that discussion because it's not important to what I'm trying to uh, uh, illustrate here. But at the end of the discussion, uh, Upali uh, wanted to go to refuge to the Buddha, Dhamma, and Sangha. And here we can see the Buddha's you know, miraculous qualities. The Buddha said, you need to think about it twice, Upali. You're a very uh, influential, popular person in your own religion, in your own sect. And uh, people depend on you. So you just can't go jumping from one religion to another. I'm just kind of paraphrasing. Um, so I don't recommend that you switch over and follow me right away. Then uh, Mr. Upali said, 
amazing, venerable sir. People from all different types of religions are always trying to convert me, and they would be happy if I went to their religion, and they would parade me across the street saying, now Mr. Upali is on our side. We have Mr. Upali. But you tell me, you know, to think about it twice, not to just uh, join your, uh, your group right away, because people depend on me. Because you say this, venerable sir, I am 100% convinced now, more than ever, that I really want to follow the Buddha, Dhamma, and Sangha. Uh, so then the Buddha said, well, since you know, you're so enthusiastic about it, I will let you become one of uh, our followers, but uh, under these conditions. And Upali said, whatever you say, venerable sir. So the Buddha said, I will let you become a follower only if you maintain your duties towards your previous religion. You still support them, you still treat them the same way and everything, because they depend on you. Then Upali said, thank you very much. Uh, I'll be more than happy to do that. So here we can see the Buddha's attitude uh, towards you know, uh, people of different religions and uh, interacting between people of different faiths. It could have been very easy for the Buddha to say, yes, you know, we have this very famous and rich person and we'll just take him and you leave your old religion behind and forget all your previous culture. But that's not what Lord Buddha said. Uh, Lord Buddha wasn't interested in converting people or making people Buddhists. He only came to teach one thing, and that's to uh, get rid of suffering. So in a similar way now, uh, uh, we should kind of apply these teachings to the, to the way we interact with people of other faiths. Uh, speaking for myself, coming back from a certain type, uh, certain type of religion, coming from a certain type of idea or faith, you kind of have this uh, idea of like, you know, you got to spread the religion or you got to, you know, <laughs> Uh, uh, like advertise, uh, that's a nice way of saying it, like advertise, you know, and try to convince other people. But as I think as Buddhists, we shouldn't take this kind of approach, and we should leave this kind of approach behind, because uh, we don't see the Buddha in this situation trying to do that. So here in Koreatown and other parts of California and the United States and throughout the world, as Buddhists, especially as people that are coming into Buddhists, as Westerners or people who didn't grow up as Buddhists, uh, we should be very careful how we present the Dhamma and how we treat other people of other faiths. And we shouldn't take this kind of uh, attitude of trying to convince everyone that it's so great. I know it's difficult because you might have experienced a lot of benefits. You might have felt a lot of uh, peace and other kinds of benefits. And you want to share that with other people. And that's natural. When you find something that's good, you want to share it. But we have to be very careful how we do that. Uh, we don't want to come off uh, as trying to uh, convert people or, or trying to, you know, uh, talk bad or bring down other people's religious beliefs. Because the Buddha wasn't like that. We can see in this story, in this uh, Upali Sutta, that the Buddha never took this kind of uh, position against people of other faiths. The Buddha never tried to convert anyone. And he wasn't interested in... Uh, arguing with people. Although he had a lot of debates, he didn't argue with them. Another thing that we can look at during the time of the Buddha as uh, in, the, in the Sutta Nipata, there's a particular sutta and it's very beautiful how it starts. The Buddha is describing all kinds of different animals and their different uh, characteristics. He talks about how birds have different kinds of feathers, how they have different kinds of colors, different types of beaks how four-legged animals have different uh, kinds of stripes. Some of them have claws, some of them have fangs. So he goes through all these animals and he says all the differences that they have. Then he gets to humans and he says, but when I look at humans, I see no differences. All humans are the same. Any difference with, uh, uh, that humans have is just conventional. So this is a very radical idea during the time of the Buddha because they were uh, stuck in a very strict uh, caste system or some sort of a hierarchy where there was no social mobility. 
and people were dis, uh, discriminated uh, upon, uh, according to their birth, where they were born. But the, the Buddha rejected this. He says that no one is born a Brahmin. No one is born an Arya or noble. One is a Brahmin or an Arya, uh, depending on their actions. So the Buddha did have some sort of a, he was a kind of a social revolutionary in his time. Um, we have to kind of uh, take this idea into our everyday lives here. Although we're very uh, progressive and in the United States, we still have some res residual uh, prejudices and uh, discrimination and racism or social class. We judge people on social class or on how much money they make. So uh, according to the Buddha, all of these differences are just conventional. We shouldn't stick, uh, put too much emphasis on them. We have to recognize that all beings are, are the same. All humans are the same. So living in this kind of environment that we find ourselves in, in Koreatown, and you see people of all different colors, different sh uh, sizes and shapes, we have to recognize that uh, whatever things we were taught or prejudices that we hold in our, or in our mind are just simply things that we've been taught and are not intrinsic in the nature of that other person. So this is a very important teaching because uh, even in a diverse place like this where people are encouraged to mix and to try other people's cultures, uh, we're still very subject to tribalism. You'll still see, you know, Mexican people hanging out with Mexican people, Korean people hanging out with Korean people, and uh, all different types of people just kind of sticking to their group, to their tribe. And uh, you can see in these kind of situations, people say things that they wouldn't say uh, if the other party was around. So I'm, I just wanted to share this uh, uh, kind of uh, teaching from the Buddha that uh, we shouldn't judge or, or fall into the trap of tribalism or judging other people or giving stereotypes. So I know most of the people here, are, that I'm not talking, it's not dir directed at you, I'm sh I'm sh most of the people here are quite liberal, but uh, we have to try to kind of help these ideas uh, uh, spread out and be more inclusive and bring in more people into our group. We have to take this like underlying tendency of tribalism and we should expand our tribe to include all people. And that's exactly what the Buddha did. He included people of all castes uh, into Buddhism, he, even into the Sangha. There's one account where all the cousins of Lord Buddha, Ananda and, and uh, many other of his cousins wanted to become monks. So they gave all their stuff to the barber. And they told them, okay, you can take all our stuff here and uh, we're gonna go become monks. So they left, but when they were leaving, he thought, well, uh, if people see me with all this stuff, they're gonna think I robbed them or, you know, I got rid of them and I just kept all their things. Uh, so I'm gonna just go with them and I'll become a Buddhist monk too. So he went behind them and they were surprised to see him there with the Buddha. And uh, these very, you know, uh, warrior caste, the second highest caste under the Brahmins, the uh, Katiyas, they said, Venerable Sir, they told the Buddha, please ordain the barber first. We have a lot of pride, and if you ordain him, he'll help us reduce our pride. <laughs> so the Buddha uh, ordained the barber first, because barbers were seen as very, very low caste, because they dealt with, like, the body, the hair, the, de the hair's dead, so. Um, so then, as soon as he got ordained, then all, then all of the Buddha's cousins had to get ordained too, and they had to bow all the time for the rest of their lives they had to bow to the barber. So uh, it's very important that we look at the Buddha's lives and the Arahant's lives and the Sangha, the members of the Sangha's lives and see how they interacted so we can see how we should act. We, we have a very uh, unfortunate situation right now in LA with homelessness. And it's very easy for us to dismiss these people and treat them bad. Maybe, you know, they're like, kind of like the barber caste were in, during the time of the Buddha for us. But we should take this example of the Buddha's cousins and let them go first. Like, um, like they let the barber go first. You know, out of all people that we should be paying attention to, we should be paying attention to those in need. 
We should be paying attention to the people who don't even have a place to stay or, or food to eat or other things. Not only that, but uh, there was uh, a lot of uh, sexism, and there still is. There's a lot of ways that uh, women are discriminated against. Even here in America and throughout the world, it's, it's practically the same as it was during the time of the Buddha and some other places in the planet. It's just as bad, but uh, the Buddha um, allowed women to, to ordain. And uh, he even told Ananda that women can become arahants. And what's very radical is that women could leave their homes. So during that time, women uh, were practically or virtually seen as property. And they were all part of arranged marriages. And in some of the practices, if the husband died, the women had to jump into the fire. Some of you that are familiar with some of the Indian traditions, you know about this. So the Buddha gave an opportunity for women who were not having a good relationship with their husbands, women who have lost their husbands, widows, and many women who didn't even want to get married. He gave them an opportunity to escape that whole uh, arranged marriage system and seek spiritual freedom. So he gave them an opportunity to get social freedom by leaving their homes and an opportunity also to get spiritual freedom so they can be liberated in two ways. Uh, so we have to kind of think in this way also. And we have to uh, uh, get rid of these little prejudices that we have uh, uh, towards women like you throw like a girl or something like that, right? Or, you know, other kind of derogatory things that are said about girls in kind of like a joking matter. Uh, they have some underlying cultural tendency and they contribute to discriminating and holding prejudice against uh, uh, women. So the Buddha was really, uh, uh, in, or Buddhism was really started as a humanistic enterprise. It was concerned with the problems of humans, with all kinds of problems, and the ultimate problem of, of suffering and death and sickness, but also the regular uh, problems of uh, interacting with others. Uh, the Sangha was created, the monastic community was created in a way that um, all monks and nuns could uh, cohabitate peacefully. And the Buddha praised uh, this kind of uh, system where everyone gets along together and works together on the same level. Uh, in the suttas, you can see the Buddha reference this certain type of group. There was some, there was some uh, sort of democracy. There was a sort of republic during the time of the Buddha uh, called the Vajjans. And they would all vote together, meet together. Uh, they would meet in harmony. And before they left, they would, leave, they would solve their problems and leave their problems there and leave in harmony. So this is the kind of advice that the Buddha gives to his Sangha. He says, you have to be like the Vajians. And as long as they're like this, uh, uh, you'll stay together. And as long as the Vajians stay this way, they can't be defeated. So actually, the Buddha gave this teaching in reference uh, to a, a question that was asked about him because there was a king who wanted to defeat the Vajians. And he knew he couldn't because they were always united working together. So we had some sort of like totalitarian leader uh, trying to take over uh, a democracy. And he wanted to find out how to do it because he couldn't find, he didn't know a way because they all worked together. And the Buddha says, yes, they cannot be defeated if they work together. So if we do not want to be taken over by uh, fascist ideas or totalitarian ideas or extremism, uh, we have to follow the Buddha's advice and work together all the time, meet together in peace and leave in peace. Uh, I know we all have our differences and it's, uh, we're very passionate about trying to do, to do good. But uh, there's some compromises that we need to make uh, for the benefit of all of us to work together. And if, we, if you really want to oppose fascism and uh, totalitarianism, the only way to do it is by having conversations, uh, not arguments. And you can find this in the suttas, how the Buddha praises these kind of qualities, seven qualities he starts off with that the, Vaj that the Vajians have. So there are many accounts during the time of the Buddha where we can see him uh, talking about social harmony and uh, being like a, so, uh, a radical uh, for the culture of that time. 
he didn't see any differences in, in people. He didn't see any differences in sexes. And then he, he wanted us to treat all beings equally. So we expand, he, we, he expanded the, the community that we have with humans to all beings. In the Karaniya Metta Sutta, it says uh, small or large, human or non-human, uh, known or unknown. May all beings be well, happy, comfortable, and peaceful. Karaniya Metta Sutta. So the Buddha was really against uh, these kind of prejudices that we have and really towards working together, uh, social harmony. So even in some of the words that the Buddha uses, we can see that he's always talking about wholesomeness or unity. These kind of, he uses these kind of words in, in many of his teachings, like samma, right? Like samma ditti, samma sankapa, samma, usually translated as right, but uh, it really means, it comes from like a word that means to make whole, wholesome. Even when he talks about states of mind, like ekagata, like to make one, like a union. So we can, if we read the Pali text and uh, other texts, we can see that the Buddha has these kind of ideas all the time of working together, coming together, everything uh, uh, working in that sort of a holistic way. The Buddhist path is a holistic way. That's why there's many uh, debates about whether it's a religion, whether it's a philosophy, whether it's a psychology. Be because Buddhism is really a, a holistic path that covers all different uh, dimensions of our lives. That's why some people say it's a way of life. Um, it's really encompassing everything that we do. That's what the Noble Eightfold Path is. It's covering every dimension of life that we have. And what for? For us to uh, work better with others. And uh, for us to be a better contribution for our communities also. So sometimes Buddhism gets a bad rap. They think it's about like leaving the world and abandoning everyone. And then you see the story of Prince Siddhartha, how he left his family. And people think, oh, that's very cruel. Why would you leave your wife with her newborn son? And all these kinds of things. But uh, the Buddha was really working towards uh, his ultimate goal of, uh, of unity, of bringing everyone together. And bringing everyone together into a state of uh, complete happiness. Uh, free from suffering, regardless of where they came from or what they believed in. So there's many, uh, uh, ben, uh, many good uh, contributions that the Buddha made at that time. And if we read the suttas, we can uh, continue this, this uh, task that the Buddha set out for us. Uh, you know, it's been 2000, over 2,500 years since uh, Buddha Sasana uh, has came to this world and we still haven't uh, perfected his teachings <laughs> and sometimes we've gone backwards. We've had 2,500 years to remove discrimination, to remove sexism, to remove tribalism, uh, even within Buddhist countries and we've had a hard time doing it. And so this is our project. Uh, you know, Buddhism isn't only a selfish project of trying to uh, liberate yourself. Uh, it, it has a, a big social dimension of helping other beings also be liberated. And if you're familiar with the story of the Bodhisattva, then you'll know this too. And actually, you can see how the Buddha acted in his own life. He went uh, back to Bimbisara because he made a promise to Bimbisara before he became the Buddha that he would teach him if he did become awakened. He went back to his family and even to his son. When his son asked for his inheritance, what did he give him? He gave him the Dhamma. So the Buddha was very concerned with other people and their welfare. It had a very uh, communal and familiar and social dimension uh, to the teachings of the Buddha, uh, the, to the Dhamma. So I didn't want to uh, talk much today. I just wanted to, uh, I didn't plan anything either. I just like to go in the moment and kind of feel the crowd where it's at. And being back home in my neighborhood in this diverse place, I just wanted to share some things that might help you thrive in here and help your community thrive wherever you're at, how we can all work together. And while, as we help others, we help ourselves. And when we help ourselves, we help others. That's one of the things that the Buddha taught us. So with this, I'll be uh, concluding my uh, Dhamma talk. And Bhante said that there will be time for uh, questions and answers. Bhante? <laughs> uh,